Well, it started way back in 1907, and through all the years of triumphs and disasters, it emerged as Crown Green Bowling's premier event. It is quite sufficient just to say the Waterloo. Don't compare it with Wembley or with Wimbledon, because the people here will tell you that by comparison, they are mere sideshows. And on finals day, they could fill this arena several times over. There it is, a packed house, what, something like 4,000 people, Looking forward to an afternoon's exciting bowling. And if you think you detect uh, a change about the Waterloo Green this year, well, you'd be right, because there is, on the west side, a brand-new stand. Cost about £150,000, built uh, by the brewery that sponsored the event. And it's not the end of the developments of this ground, because eventually, on the north side, there'll also be a new stand there, and that will increase the capacity of the Waterloo to something like 5,000. Well, with me this afternoon, and... Uh, helping to talk about what happens and the commentaries uh, from both sides of bowling, really. From Crown Green Bowling, we have uh, Noel Burrows, of course, a Waterloo champion. And uh, from the other side, from the flat game, Mal Hughes, uh, one of the best players in the country, indoor particularly. Uh, Noel, first of all, the story of your Waterloo this year. Yes, well, uh, I thought I was doing quite well until the fifth round and uh, came unstuck, as they say. Yeah. The uh, green today particularly is in good condition, is it? I mean, these Very are good, good bowling conditions. Very good indeed, yes. Jack Lees looks after it perfectly this season through all the dry weather. We ought to mention at this stage, I don't know if you knew, but uh, Bobby Hull, who's the groundsman here, he's uh, a lot of credit, of course, for the condition of the green, but he's actually in hospital at the moment. He's got a broken hip, so we, uh, we wish him well for all his hard work. But they've taken an awful lot of grass off it. They've had to cut it because the grass is still growing. What, do you think effect that, what effect do you think that will have? Uh, well, normally this time of the year uh, you get a lot of uh, dew and uh, also we've been having some warm spells as well, uh, as well as this uh, vein that we've been having. Uh, what tends to happen on the Waterloo finals day is that the green is a bit heavier in the morning than some players expect. Uh, it's happened to the favourite this morning, Len Higginbottom, he just didn't get to grips at all. So you've got to be careful to adjust your game even yep. on finals day. Well, Mal Hughes, uh, it's yeah. nice to see you here at uh, Crown Green Bowling. Is it, is it a game that you actually enjoy, perhaps even as much as the flat? Oh, I think so, uh, Richard. I think uh, it's the first time I've been to Waterloo. I've always wanted to come. A lot of my friends have been across here on holiday for a week for this particular tournament. So this is my first visit. Very impressed with the crowd, very impressed with the bowling. I think the green cube must have tripped over the hump in the middle, I think, uh, <laughs> when he's got knocked his hip out. It has a certain earthy flavour, doesn't it, Crown Green Bowling? It does, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's crowd participation, which we lack in the flat, I think. And I think this is good for the game. And I think we need more and more of it, whichever court we're in. Now, uh, whichever code, I mean, you two are going to be uh, perhaps in opposition not too long, towards the end of October, uh, towards in the uh, indoor championships. You've played, you've played against each other before, haven't you? Oh, yes, yes, I have um, treasured memories of uh, um, the Tally Ho Bowling Club in Warwickshire where we played uh, Tony Poole and Noel, and David Bryant and I played against them. We played them in the crown, we played them in the flat, and believe it or not, we lost the crown 21-19 and they won and we won the flat 21-19 so we finished even Stephen. Well that's so uh, for a return. That's perhaps how it how it should be, gentlemen. Thank yeah. you. We'll be coming back to you again uh, at various stages during the afternoon. Because now we can bring you news of the draw for the semi-finals of the Waterloo Championship. There it is, you see it there. The first semi-final we'll be seeing this afternoon brings together Steve Ellis from Kirkham near Blackpool. Uh, he was uh, a finalist at the Waterloo in 1971 and 1974, though never a winner. Perhaps it could be third time lucky for him. And in his semi-final, he'll be playing Fred Harrison, who is a postman, and he's from Bolton. The second semi-final, Tommy Hayes, uh, known in Crown Green Bowling as the Mighty Atom. And when you see him, you'll see why. He's, uh, what, about five foot one tall. He's from Hyde, and his opponent in the semi-final will be John Lees from Preston. So, that's the uh, draw. Noel, uh, who do you fancy? I would think perhaps uh, Steve Ellis has got to be a favourite. Yes, uh, my money would be on Steve. He's been this far before and uh, experienced the disappointment. I think it will just bring that little bit extra out in him. It's a long time, though, since he's been in a final, isn't it? I know. You don't ever forget being in the final day at the Waterloo. He was a very young man, of course, well, even in 1974. Yes, I think the first time he was in the final, 1971, I think he was only 18 then. So your money will be on Steve Ellis? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, 
see uh, Noel, Mo Noel Burrows' money is riding on Steve Ellis. He's the man in action in the first semi-final. Steve Ellis is playing Harrison, and uh, we join it with the score at 39 to Steve Ellis. again altered the land never sticking anywhere too long always wandering about the screen and keeping good control keeping Harrison altering his land all the time Harrison playing decent balls that'll be much luck played one here but it might just chuck it it's packed up Two good woods there from each player. Harrison at the moment, lying second, and Ellis played a good good ball here. It's round the jack. Lies two. And they must they must look a bit nasty to Harrison then. He's got to play a good ball here. Nothing else will do. Well he's roaded. Roaded. Chances. Chances if it runs. Goes on the card. A brilliant ball by Harrison there. One to Harrison. Listen to that applause. He deserves it. Yes, he deserves the applause, does Fred Harrison. Uh, he probably, in view of the bad luck he had in the last end, uh, deserved it doubly so, no one would think. Yeah, he, he was very unlucky the last end, uh, but that's the way it goes in bowling. Uh, you've got to have a little bit of luck to win a competition like this. Well, they say you make your own luck, so uh, perhaps Fred Harrison's not reflecting too much on what's happened. Off into the corner again. Harrison again looks nicely roaded. Again, gone a long way, but he's labouring a bit now. He wants you to get down the hill and run away. And again. Big yard shot. Ellis got this one to beat. The ball start to kick round now. Should start moving a bit to the left, but it's going straight on. Oh, bad ball from Ellis. Just missed the road. Difficult mark. Coming down, thump peg, and Harrison again on the road. It misses his own ball. It's a real in this. Just glanced into the bottom. Well, Ellis, can you get there? Listen to the crowd, they'll tip this ball if it's any sort of a chance. Ellis waving it on. Now there's a bit of an inquest. Harrison not over happy. Up to now, fancies his own a little bit. He's doing the fairy dancing and Freddy's planting his feet in. Very nice. Almost three. One, two, uh, tapped it in, conceded the end. One to Ellis. Steve Ellis, 14, seven. Fred Harrison's footwork saving the, uh, the measure. Steve Ellis, 14. Fred Harrison, 10. Just moving a little bit, weaving away just to the left. It's a fair ball, stops level, it'll want some licking. Ellis now comes come really a fairly long way. Harrison again, smack on the road. Just pegs a little bit, it might pinch it, but it's just hung out. It's 
is Ellis' second ball. If he wraps that ball of Harrison's, he can make it. Knocks it in. Oh, Christmas comes early. Didn't want to do that. Very, very unfortunate that for Ellis. And now Harrison has a chance to step in and make another. And what do you think? Can he do it? Just give up short. One to Harrison with a little bit of help from Ellis. So Fred Harrison, who looked uh, at a stage or two as though he was about to be overwhelmed, has uh, pulled his game together well. Firmly in the game. Well, it's nice, uh, Richard and Noel, you know, to see these lads because they both have very, very good deliveries. Noel, I mean, you're a bit of a purist in this game. You, you get them out pretty smooth, but, you know, what do you think about the delivery of these lads compared to some? Yes, well, Steve especially has got a very smooth delivery. Um, obviously, you want to deliver your ball as smoothly as possible because uh, it won't wander off the road too far, then. One in the box. Ellis. And the crowd up. A little bit restless. They want Harrison to be stopping now because he's a bit close to the ditch, but it's counting. Funny piece of land this. Down in the bottom, and then they start to hook away up in the air. This will start winging away across to the right. Just wins it now, can't lose. Cracking ball from Ellis. Steve Ellis, 15, well played, Steve Ellis. Uh, winning that end with just uh, a single of his woods still on the green. Ellis, uh, who took over the favourites' mantle when he beat Len Higginbottom in his uh, quarter-final. Steve Ellis from Kirk, near Blackpool. Standing nice and comfortable. Just four chalks in front of Fred Harrison at the back there from Bolton. Ellis had a really good look at this land. He's an insurance man, and he looks to have a pretty good policy going at the moment. Four chokes in front. Yes, there's one of the benefits, Richard. About four inches at the back of the jack. bit of company for the other two excellent balls there from Alice smack on a road I think Harris Harrison is contemplating firing at him and he's thrown it see what happens he's bang summit taking one out half a loaf is better than none Ellis just got one out of it there stood a double and Harris Harrison smacked the other off Fred Harrison there restricting Steve Ellis to a single. But Ellis still with the advantage of setting the mark. Fairly short distance. Look at this, good control again on the finger peg mark, about 30 yards down the middle of the green, and Harrison's not going to be a million mile away, but he's just gone round the back. Oh, 
Played far enough. Not a wrong ball to play. Can't be short. Ellis asking for information. Watch this ball now start to move to the right. Now just swing a little. Come on down the hill. A little bit more. Died short. But lies a double. Harrison's got to do something here, Harrison, to stop it. Can he peg hard? Can he run again? A Super Bowl? No, just outside. One to Ellis. So the game, uh, judging by the score, slipping away from Fred Harrison. 17-11 in arrears. Okay, and, uh, Keith. Steve Ellis, favourite for Waterloo this year. <laughs> Ellis again, back down the middle of the green, just running again, played a nagging ball, quite close. Nothing short of a good ball going to lick that. It's got to get one inside that. Round about a foot, and Harrison's done it. If he can stop a dead length, he's just gone round the back and gone out. Stephen Ellis. Nice handy lead. Trying to just bang into his other, but he's missed the road altogether. play far enough nothing for short and he stop a length and win gotta go away Ellis still giving them a good call to looking over still not made any signals both hands in pockets Fred I think conceded the end one to Ellis Another single, Steve Ellis. Three short of victory now. Oh, Richard and Noel, it's, in, uh, you know, very, very significant in this game. There's only been one double pegged. All the others have been done in, si in singles. And although, uh, Noel, you know, you know what it's like trying to work hard for jokes. And Ellis has worked really hard because Harrison's played very well, hasn't he, Noel? He's played he... well, funnily enough, when Steve's been leading the jack. Um, Steve has led very good, very well, and uh, <laughs> Fred's come up and beaten just like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, when he gets the jack, Fred, he's uh, made a bad lead himself, which has let Steve back in again. Well, Ellis now got to make his mind up, hasn't he, what he's going to do with us. I think he might throw one at it. But he's played, he's played, he might be trying to bang into that ball and just flirt the jack about a yard through, but he's played short, rather surprising ball. Perhaps quite happy to concede one to Harrison at this end because he's got a few jokes to play with. Harrison now, he knows he's got to get a few more, gets round this ball. Well, a lot of applause there because Harrison stepped in and made a double. Well, it's not lost yet for Fred Harrison. It'll be interesting to see uh, what he does with the jack now because he hasn't uh, been too successful previously when he's tried long marks. I wonder if he'll stick to that. Obviously, Harry still thinks he's got a chance over a distance, Fred Harrison. Oh, I think Fred would send him to Bolton if he could, Richard. He'd send him another 30 mile farther because he knows that's where the road to victory lies for him. He can't lick Ellis on short marks. The scorecard proves that. 
Now he's made a bad lead. Ellis now again with a little bit of room to work in. Got a play. Crowd wishing this ball on, but it's packed up. Harrison gets a couple at this end. It could be a bit of a revival. Is he going to bag? He's made it. Oh! The crowd all pointing now. They think that Ellis is on. Well, that was Ken Alcock there, the referee, just round at the back of the end. Not made a definite decision. Ellis now got a run. It's not in the end, that one. Nothing to do with it. It just fell out. It just fell on its back, Steve, your ball. Well, he may have just got away with it. Ellis has not... Uh, Claim the end. Harrison's non committal, he said nothing. Say when you're touching. Right. Now, Mr. Harrison's ball now. The first ball of measured's in. Mr. Harrison's in. Oh, he got the verdict. Very, very tight. Fordor finished there on the string. And Ellis, again, fortunate to count the end. Harrison, very, very unlucky, really, to run into the back of that ball. But it has to be said, as you said before, Noel, that uh, Fred Harrison made a bad lead again. Again, yes. There's one thing I've noticed during this game. Uh, Steve's balls tend to be slightly weaker than, uh, than Fred's. Uh, it looked at that last end as though Feds was going to go back to the jack, but it just pegged at the at the last minute where Steve's ball kept going straight. It is noted for uh, playing with weak balls this green, and uh, Steve's balls seem just that little bit more suited than Feds. Freddy's slide had just gone through. Fell over anyway, things are not going for Harrison. Watch them balls, he was right about your comments, Noel, about his balls being a bit weak. He wants to get them to the doctors, you know, they're not too well. He slipped away off the road there. As weak as water. Maybe that's why he's playing the Peggy Marks and Harrison's missed the road altogether. Oh, he could have done a robbery act here, Ellis. Could lay game. Certainly got one. Take it to the final here. But Harrison, but Harrison likes it. He thinks he's won the end and gets the chalk. Fred Harrison prolongs the action. He's on 14. Steve Ellis, 19. Steve Ellis needing a double to go through to the final. Well, he needed that single, Richard. You know, it just got the verdict there. Ellis was looking around for a double, but Harrison got the end, and he's led a fair ball. Fighting for his life now, Harrison. Ellis wants two shots to get into the final. Harrison needs another seven. again far enough far enough could go in the pit this missing the jack gone gone off the green again an unlucky ball really by Harrison he was only about an inch overplayed it's a bit unfortunate that no wasn't it at that stage he wanted a double yes it only just went off the green really if it had been another uh, foot up up the green uh, it wouldn't have gone off just barely trickled off he wants to score, you see. He wants to score. Well, Ellis has played far enough. He's trying to cut this ball out of Harrison's and just missed doing it. One to Fred Harrison. 
the lad from Bolton fighting his way back to get into this match again. Well, it was a brave attempt by Steve Ellis. He played that second wood with some force, hoping to uh, sit out uh, Harrison's wood that, uh, as it proved, won it. And fed Harrison back uh, over, what, 70-odd yards, Harry? Yes, it's the say at Bulls that some people don't go this far on the holidays. Because Fred's sending it as far as he can, hoping to play some near Bulls. Counts the next couple of ends, Harrison. You'll hear the odds change round a little bit. Close the gap, but he's played a no ball. Left it on the map. Ellison a chance of victory here. He can play two decent balls. He's got a place in the final, and the first one's going up now to the jack. Good ball. Just rubbed the jack and waddled its way about a yard past. Not easy, and the crowd condemning this ball. They think it's up the road and short. Fred Harrison could be out here, and Ellis now a chance to go into the final. Let the crowd take this one in. The shouts have weighed in. Weighed in, the applause. Can it count? Well, they're applauding, and Harrison's conceded. It's 2 to Ellis. Stephen Ellis wins the semi final of the Waterloo 21 15. Remarkable, exactly 10 years since Steve Ellis last appeared in a Waterloo final, and he's there again. Well, uh, the weather's turned a little unkind to us, but uh, we won't let that concern us too much. Noel Burrows, Steve Ellis was your choice for that semi-final for the championship. Presumably you think you're right, do you? Well, so far, so good, yes. Uh, unfortunately, when you tip people, they, they go and get beaten, but uh, I think I'm going to be right. He must be gaining in confidence. I mean, that was quite an emphatic win, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the main difference between the two players in that game was that uh, Steve led well to his own jack. When he sent the jack out, he played a uh, fair ball each time, and Fred, Fred didn't. There's a fairly good chance, by the looks of it, that uh, it might be quite wet by the time we get to the final. Do you think that uh, might have any bearing on it? It's a little overcast at the moment, but it seems to be bright enough up over there. I think we'll be all right. Yeah. Steve Ellis, uh, very much a man for all seasons, so we'll be seeing uh, Steve in the final, but uh, now we have uh, live action in the second semi-final, Tommy Hayes from Hyde is playing John Lees from Preston. And for the up-to-date details on that game, the commentator, Harry Rigby. The semi-final here between Tommy Hayes and John Lees. It stands now with Hayes 10 and John Lees from Preston is 13. Got the makings of a real good scrap here between Tommy Hayes from Hyde in Cheshire. And Lee's played a good ball there. A little bit of difficulty with the going now. He's back with the rain. Hayes now trying to beat a good ball, but plays away on the top side and gone out. Lee's now standing one and coming for a double. Number eight, they're in blue. John Lee's who hails from Preston. Plays for Brown Edge. There's Tommy Hayes, number six. A mighty little player from the Greater Manchester area. There was, I think, Harry, quite a lot of betting on uh, Tommy Hayes before this uh, semi-final began. Bit of a bit of a chance for the man. 
Well, a very popular little player, Tommy. I mean, he always gives good value for money, good trier, really proficient player. I mean, Noel, that's with us today, knows full well that Tommy's been a member of his uh, Greater Manchester County side and always been a good asset to them. Extremely good competitive player. But John Lees as well, of course, has featured for Lancashire in the past. Another top-class county man looking to score this major title, the Waterloo. Both got the rags out now, wiping the woods because they're picking up the moisture from the green. Conditions just a little bit slippy, so they don't want to make a mistake in sending these balls. And John Lee's now played one. this ball for the minute but it's taxiing up done its best but it's not one one to lease again setting the mark fairly long mark across the diagonal mark across the middle of the green About 35 40 yards plays just on the top side but a good length Tommy Hayes from the Georgian Dragon Bowling Club in Hyde he's played up must have a chance if he can pick the jack up and he's done it shunted the jack counted John Lee's four asking feet. for instructions, giving them back four feet. That's the amount of room he's got to win in. Still going off to run. Might be sure the call just won it. Can it break its neck to get in? Could be second. The fancy in. Your favourite! Yeah, the uh, referee just asked uh, Lees whether he fancied it. Uh, don't think the referee did. Told Tommy Hayes he fancied it, but uh, Tommy Hayes is uh, striding out to have a look for himself. Yes, not buying the advice, Tommy. Too important. Semi-final, a place in the final of the Waterloo at stake. Tommy's coming to have a look for himself. Tommy certainly weighing the odds up, which way to come in. Got to decide in his own mind. Very interesting to watch this last ball of Tommy's, Noel, because you know you've done that yourself many a time. You go back with the knowledge in your head, you know who's on, and what you do with the next ball is entirely up to you. Well, that's it. Uh, just at this particular end, uh, we don't really know who's in. Uh, not even from the way Tommy's acting, we don't know. We'll only know from the way he sends his ball. If he plays to reach, then he must be thinking that he's not in. I would think, uh, if, he, if, he, if he thinks he's in, that he'll possibly change his peg and try and get one round the back. Yes, he's done that. He's turned the ball round, he's trying to play up. Doesn't want to touch that ball, but that, he shot Hayes, which to me indicates he fancies his chances here of pegging a single. We'll see what happens in the measure. Try that. 
Mr. Hayes is balls in. Yes, just got the verdict there, Hayes. Tight measure, but Hayes was right. Just counted a single now. Got to peg a few more to catch this man from Preston, John Lees, who's four in front. Down second ball of the end, looking to play one roundabout. Hayes, well, they're both beatable. He's one about two foot short and one a yard That's over. Won it, John. Certainly won it. Asking if he's only one, John Lee's very important information to him. It governs the next ball. He's played at it, trying to be far enough. Can he get inside this ball and miss it? He's into it. So Tommy Hayes uh, counting one from that end. He could uh, well do with putting together. A little burst of chalks now. Hayes 15 12 in arrears. Good lead. Played one roundabout there, Noel. On yeah. a bit of your old territory, this. Yes, yeah, a good ball, but this one coming out is going to beat it, Alan. from Lees just sat the jack half Tommy Hayes would and sat inside to count the end and Hayes now away on the top side just lifted it a little bit too much well, Tommy Hayes can't win this end it's just a question of whether John Lees can count two oh another great ball there from Lees Made two out of a really good late lead from Hayes. John Lees advances to 17. Tommy Hayes 12. The first man to 21 wins it. gone drifting past the jack Hayes with a bit of room to work in number six the white shirt Tommy Hayes just goes forward after the wood gotta be stopping gotta stop a length must win level number eight John Lees Clark of works British Telecom played to get inside that ball of Hayes, waving it on, but could well have packed up. He likes it. Will you that, Tom? The referee Ken Alcock just nipped in there a bit quickly and confirmed the bad news to Tommy Hayes. Won it, but Hayes has found the answer.
Only about a yard by. Good lease from Hayes. Short. He's got to run this ball. Shorter legs. Can't get there. Now the sun's returned. A few spots of rain flying about. Gone away, and now it's sunshine. Might be the turn of events to lead Hayes up to a winning break. Lies two at the moment, he's four in arrears. He's got to try and count the end. It's labouring this ball. It might just pack up. If he gets down the hill, it can win it. Hayes fancies his own. There's John Lees. That's the lie of the balls. Hayes now footing the balls. Two, three, four. Two, three. For oh, bit of a chance on the feet. I think Hayes, on his own measurement by his feet, must be slight favourite here to peg the end. I'll measure the other ball first. Try that. Today's is one. Yeah, just pinched a vital single there, Tommy Hayes. Very, very tight measure. But he got it. Close the gap now to just three chalks. To start coming down this ball somewhere, drop again and a bit more. Fair ball, just about 18 inches past the jack. John Lee's now with this one to lick. Back on the road if he can run. The farther it runs, now it'll start to climb down and win the end. Oh, crawled up the top side, could be first. People in the crowd there asking who's on. Oh, Hayes, is he far enough? Has he left it on the map? to short. What a bad ball there from Tommy Hayes. That's the last thing he should have done. But he wishes he could have that one back and play it again. Hayes is he's certainly doing taps his own ball. He must have made it. Just turned his own ball over there on the top side and counted the end. Pinch a single to put him 18-14 in front of Tommy Hayes. The man from Hyde in Cheshire. All his club people at the Georgian Dragon at Hyde will be rooting for Tommy Hayes, one of the star players in the Greater Manchester County setup, but. Having a bit of a hard time at the moment with John Lee's. Lee's got some call on unless he can pick the jack up. And about four and a half, five foot by. Tommy is waving this ball on. Wonders if it can get there. Still going, still going. Good way off the jack. John Lee's now with the desert to get in. Four foot short and four foot over the first two balls. And now if he can just push the jack a little bit. Oh, very good ball. Front toucher. Here's now with an impossible task, asking if he's got two. Well, 
played at the end. Certainly got to be far enough. Whatever happens, it's got to be far enough. Could leave a double if it runs. Oh, might have gone. Tommy Hayes arrived at the end to survey the damage. Certainly got one. Got to bring the string men on again. The referee. You know, the measures. Met a yellow ball first. It's Mr. Hayes. Yellow ball first. Say when you touch it. Try that. The yellow ball's in. They went that way. Well, Lee's just pegs a single there after the measure. Goes to 19 now, just a couple of chalks off victory. Tommy Hayes at the back, 14. John Lee's looking for a double to secure a place in the final. This Waterloo handicap and leads the sort of ball that looks as though he may well get there. He is now really having to work hard against this man, Lee. He's, he's beginning to lead well. Hayes plays into the end but goes four foot by. He's playing to count another. He does, he can lie again, but he's short. We'll get Have to the run. Gone. Referee there issuing a caution. Just said Only don't one. get too near it. Not Only supposed one. to get within a metre of a running ball. And the referee again. Just giving a quiet caution to John Lees not to get too enthusiastic. Oh, done the ball. Very good wood there from Tommy Hayes. Sat the ball out clean as a whistle. That was a real pressure ball from Hayes. Tommy Hayes was staring defeat in the face and now trying to play some really good balls to get back into this match. Four foot, Tommy. Plays a short ball. A little bit too Four much foot. room to work in there. Please. Must be quite pleased that he hasn't got a really good ball to beat. A bit of a quick murmur from the crowd here. Just wondering. Not beat it. There's the referee hurrying round the back. Could well be that Hayes is still in. That's perfect. Asking for information and they confirm to Tommy Hayes that he's big favourite at the moment. One to play, got to be far enough. Must pass his own ball. Doesn't hit that play the ball off a road. Not away and out on the top that. side. Oh, right. here's Mr. That's Glorious one, Chance. John. That's favourite. This is the first. Can't lose. One to John Lees of Preston. That takes him to 20. He wants one more for victory. And that puts him in the final of the Waterloo.
He's asking for two. Against the referee's advice, Tommy Hayes is strong favourite to count second. But this is so important to John Lees. Imagine Mr. Lees first. Say when you touch him. Further. He's asking for another measure. Not Fair satisfied right. with the first tape. Okay. That's a little bit of controversy here about the measure. It's extremely right. tight. That. Referee just asking Lees to. There's no doubt he's weighed in on the second measure. Lees gets the verdict after asking for another measure when they measured him. Yeah, no, but it slipped the thing, yeah, the finger off. Explanation. Hayes is asking right. for a reasonable explanation. Finished up a All bit right. controversial. Two. He's signalling to. Two. And the game's over. Two. Two, it was. I bet you that ball in there. Well, they're not happy, they think it's very unsatisfactory. <laughs> Declared the match finished, Tommy Hayes very disconsolate there, the crowd not taking too kindly to it, and Hayes not happy with that. Measured the first time, counted in, and then the referee, on John Lee's advice, measured the end again, and it must have been that perhaps the tape slipped or something like that, but anyway, Hayes finished up out of the handicap. And then it was a great pity because it'd been such a good match. And then John Lees has now clinched his place in the final, beating Tommy Hayes at 21 15. But that was most unusual. It should finish, you know, on a measure. Kept. Tommy Hayes there hanging about, but not quite certain, but he took it very sportingly at the end, but he must have felt very disappointed. It's been a marvellous uh, match, but perhaps a difficult way to end it. Then it's the crowd all buzzing about this particular decision, but the bets have gone, and now John Lees joins Steve Ellis in the final. Ellis now looking for a, a great a final appearance because of his two previous shows in the final. He got licked twice, 1971 by Joe Bradbury from Romilly. And then it's the great final now that we're looking forward to between Stephen Ellis and John Lees. Well, the second semi-final at the Waterloo this year ends in some controversy, but uh, in victory for John Lees. We'll perhaps have something more to say about that a little bit later on. But with me now is Jack Lee, not to be confused with John Lees, Jack Lee, who is the uh, bowling manager at the Waterloo. Now then, Jack, I suppose the, the big talking point this year, so far as uh, bowlers have been, has been concerned and uh, looking after greens and that sort of thing, has been the drought. Now, has it affected you in Blackpool? Oh, it certainly has. I don't think we've had about, I don't think we've had four days rain during the whole of the bowling season. We opened up on April the 1st, and really speaking, I don't know where my watering equipment is, really, until the end of June or maybe middle of July. But when you consider that we've all, I think we've watered the green 15 times, at least in April and May. So it's been absolutely ridiculous with regards uh, watering, you know. What about the kind of restrictions that were applied to all sorts of activities on watering? I mean, did they affect you as well? Oh, yes. Uh, well, in the first restriction that came into force, we, uh, we were allowed to carry on watering um, market gardeners and uh, sports fields. 
But when the block came a few weeks ago, that no water whatsoever anywhere near the green, um, the rain came about four days later, which was a, a godsend, really. Mind that I had been reported for water in the green one Saturday night. Actually, I was three parts drunk, miles away, but uh, some kind gentleman reported me to the water board that I'd got two hose pipes on here. That wasn't true, obviously, Jack. Obviously, it wasn't true, no. You, are, you aren't a lawbreaker, I know that. Not a really. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, despite all that, uh, the green is in, in excellent condition. Now, who takes the credit for that? Well, I've got a good... Um, green oils do well, really. The, um, they've got a good maintenance staff. The lads come up to fertilise the green and to keep it in tip-top condition. They leave me instructions and my staff here... Bobby especially, God rest him, he's in hospital at the moment, my greensman. All the best, Bobby, if you're still there, get well soon. I'd like to see you back as soon as possible. Yeah, Bob's in hospital with a broken hip, but uh, as for the arena itself, and we've got this large new stand here on the west side, uh, it's looking quite impressive now, isn't it? I only hope that uh, the kind company that I work for will see the way clear in extending this stand round to the north stand in the non-too-distant future, and then I really think we'll have the best arena for bowling in the, anywhere in the world. So, we certainly haven't seen uh, an end to the developments then on the Waterloo Green. Uh, Noel Burrows, uh, a Waterloo champion, of course. We've got a new stand here, and possibly a, a big new one here. I imagine that you would think that the Waterloo won't lose any of its uh, atmosphere as a result of that. Oh, I'm sure it'll gain from uh, all the alterations. Uh, you know, it's getting better and better. Is it, uh, we always say from the sidelines that it's an exciting place, the Waterloo Championship itself. I mean, that's true of the bowlers as well, is it? Oh, yes, I think uh, it's everyone's dream to get to the final day of the Waterloo. Uh, many a bowler can tell stories of how he got this far and then didn't quite make it. And, and there's those that have made it. And, uh, you know, it's one of the most fa fabulous feelings I've ever experienced winning this. It's a long time ago now as well. <laughs> yes, it is rather a long time, isn't it? <laughs> Twelve years ago, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's not, dwell on the, let's not dwell on the history. You've watched both the semi-finals this afternoon. We'll just wait for the competition from the other announcer. That's it. You've watched both the semi-finals this afternoon. Uh, impressions now? I think uh, just that little bit extra knowledge of the green, uh, being more or less a local fella, uh, I've got to plump for Steve Ellis. Yeah, you, I mean, you started with Steve Ellis before the semi-finals. You've seen nothing likely to change your mind. No, John Lees has played well, but uh, you never know at this game, of course. Uh, you know, I can back Steve now and, uh, and John will go and win, and you, you can't really tell. But uh, on the performances so far, Steve's just my favourite. He's certainly got quite an opponent, though, in John Lees, hasn't he? Yes, as I say, John's play played well. He's uh, kept his nerve, which uh, on finals day in this arena takes some doing. There's many a good player folded under, under the uh, strain of playing in front of a big crowd. Thanks, Noel. Let's uh, reintroduce a man who is, uh, to some extent, on uh, foreign territory. In case anybody doesn't know, Mal Hughes is uh, one of the country's top flat bowlers. Now, because many more people can hear us, Mal, uh, tell us what your impressions have been so far. Well, I, I thought this particular tournament uh, today that I've watched has been tremendous. And uh, it just culminating in that last measure, I think... The crowd just probably didn't realise that the, the measure had been moved. We found out later. I think they should all know about it now. But really, it's been tremendous. Spectator particip participation, as I said before, is out of this world. We need more and more of this uh, in the bowling world. Now, uh, you'll be in action not too far from here in Preston in the not-too-distant future. Tell us about that. Well, of course, we're now talking about the indoor service, which, of course, is uh, there's no wind, no rain, no sun. We're just enjoyable bowls. We need plenty of people there. All these people, I'd love to see them at Preston, make it a great uh, occasion for the bowlers. And uh, Noel Burrows taking part in the same competition? That's right, yes. I hope to just do a bit better than I did last year. And, well, it would be nice to win it, but uh, of course these flat green uh, bowlers are playing that game all the time and uh, I'll be getting a lot of practice in before then. I know that, I mean, you really look forward to playing flat indoor, don't you? Yes, I first uh, got a taste of it about four years ago at Darlington and, uh, you know, all these people that say crown green bowlers are better than flat green and all this sort of thing, well, uh, they want to try it, especially against the top players, it's uh, not as easy as it looks.
Do you still uh, do you still get some ribbing in between players from the flat and from Crown? Oh yes, I mean Mal and I here would have a go at each other and uh, take the mickey a little bit, but uh, I think we've also got a lot of respect for each other as well. I think it's probably worth noting, of course, that the winner of the Waterloo here today uh, does in fact get a place in that uh, UK indoor championships. Uh, it might, to them, be foreign territory, mightn't it? It possibly will, yes. Uh, I don't think either Tommy or uh, John Lees have... Uh, sorry, either Steve Ellis or John Lees have uh, played flat green balls before. I'm, I could be mistaken, but uh, it could be rather an ordeal, unless they get some practice in, of course. Well, let's take the opportunity while we've got an expert here. If you were offering some advice, Mal, to uh, a fellow from Crown Green who gets a place uh, in the UK Indoor Championships, what would you tell him? Oh, well, he's definitely got to change his balls for a start. I mean, the balls that they play with in weight it, uh, are much lighter than our own balls. We're playing with something like three and a half pound balls, and they're playing with an average of about 210, 212. So obviously, we need, um, they need to go up in size, and they need something with a bit of bias in them. I noticed some of these lads are playing today with what they call the narrow, narrow line, is it? Or the, what's that, the weight or some, whatever, I can't remember, I don't know the terms, but the terms uh, lose me completely when I'm stood among the crowd. But I think, certainly, get plenty of practice in. This, the flat green is a little bit different uh, to the crown. We've lost the old pot pie in the middle, of course, so it's now straight up and down. The balls will bias, never mind the crown. Gentlemen, thanks very much. And uh, just incidentally, amongst these spectators, there's quite a familiar face over there on the edge of the green. Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Shane. Who you probably know as Ted Bovis from uh, yes. Heidi High. Welcome, Paul. Well, it's great to be here. Hey, that was exciting, that last game, wasn't it? It was exciting. Love it. I used to uh, play a bit when I was a kid, but mostly I used to carry my dad's balls you know I used to go with him because he used to play for the YEB in Yorkshire Yorkshire Electricity Board it's a great game it's not an old man's game a, a lot of years ago everybody thought it was an old man's game not at all there's all the young kids playing today and I think it's a great game yeah I mean you are in fact from uh, a part of the world where crown green bowling is very strong aren't you yes I am I'm from Rotherham in South Yorkshire and, and all all around that area uh, like the brass bands and and, and bowling and uh, Yorkshire pudding and black pudding, we have that flown in from Lancashire, you know, because uh, over the hill. <laughs> do they allow it to cross, yes? Yes, they do, yes. Nice people, the Lancashire people, nothing wrong with them. I've got to say that because I'm outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've got quite a crowd here this afternoon, but uh, you've been drawing some crowds as well in Blackpool, haven't you? Tell us about that. Yes, we've been here for ten weeks uh, at the end of this Saturday. This Saturday coming, we finish, and then on Monday we start another six series, another six episodes of IDI. So it'll be on again round about Christmas, folks. So don't forget, Hardy High will be back. What a plug. Just tell everybody what sort of process you've got to go through. I mean, you start really with the new series of Heidi High on Monday morning, is that right? Yes, we do. I shall be on the M1 about half past 6 a.m. Monday morning, flying down to North Acton to uh, rehearse before we go down to Harwich to do the filming. Where we, that's where we do the outside filming. And then we do six weeks in London, then we all do our different ways into pantomimes and whatever, so we're all uh, pretty lucky, actually. And is it still the same cast, basically? I mean, uh, have we still got Gladys and that sort of thing? Yes, you've got them all apart from Simon Cadell, lovely Simon Cadell, but he's left, but we've got another guy coming in. I can tell you who it is now because it's, uh, it's public knowledge. He's not known on telly because David Croft and Jimmy Perry don't use known faces when they start. His name is David Griffin, he's playing a XREF pilot called... Uh, uh, Clive Dempster talks very much like that, you know, and he's a lovely guy. And of course, Gladys has got somebody else to madly fall in love with. Is another one that Ted can fiddle. So it's it's really a shot in the army in 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 a, in a way. Are you still in good voice, Paul? Are you going to be doing a bit of singing as well? Uh, not this series. No, Gladys is doing a bit of singing this series. It's her turn. Yes. <laughs> Well, Paul Shane, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I'm sure that you're looking forward to the final of the Waterloo this year, as we all are. I certainly am, and good luck to whoever the winner may be. I'm sure it'll be a fantastic match. Heidi hi! <laughs> Paul Shane, thanks very much indeed. But uh, before we go to that uh, final of this year's Waterloo, let's remind ourselves of what uh, happened last year. The final of the 1983 Waterloo, it brought together Barry Henstead, and a man who was having a brilliant year in Crown Green Bowling, Stan Frith.
again Henstead can't make a lead to save his life he's tried to plant one round the jack and went rumbling through again Bit of a near one there from Frith. Henstead making it hard work. Can he get through? Shaved the jack and ball and gone out. Steps in smartly there with a good double. Yes, quick to claim him some uh, a pair of very good woods from Stan Frith. Takes him on to 18. Barry Henstead 13. 21 up. So Stan Frith. Poised. This is the fascination of Crown Green Bowls now. He's three chalks short of becoming the champion. Could all be over very quickly. But on the other hand, we've seen the uh, calibre of Barry Henstead. Well, Frith played a bit of a wayward ball there in He's back in his favourite corner. Just a little bit off the road. Henstead certainly far enough. Got to be stopping if it's going to count. Frith following that ball. Likes it a bit better this time. Just a yard by. Got to find it. He's got to get the brakes on. Still going. Could have left a double. Fred thinks he's two. Puts his hands up. Takes him to within one chalk of victory if Henstead concedes the end. It's 2013 to Stan Frith. He just needs one chalk and he becomes the Waterloo champion. Game really from the midway stage slipped away from Barry Henstead. Oh, Frith led a real ball for game. Good long raking corner mark goes finger peg into the corner. Henstead now looking for something to save what looks like a disaster. Gone to far in the ditch. Padding, padding along after this ball, Frith. And again. Well, he's played a brilliant double here. Henstead has got least to lick, otherwise he's out. And Frith is the champion. Listen to the crowd now. Short, short. Frith has weighed in. Winner of the Waterloo. Beating Barry Henstead of Wigan 21 13 in the final. Congratulations. Yeah, quite well. obviously for Stan Frith, and, uh, but time moves on. The old champion gives way, and uh, this afternoon we'll be crowning a new Waterloo champion. The players are now on the green. Just a reminder it's Steve Ellis in the final against John Lees. To take up the commentary is Harry Rigby. 
Well, the start of the 76th Waterloo final between Stephen Ellis of Kirkham near Blackpool, number one in green, and the man in blue who wins the jack and the right to set the first mark is John Lees from Preston. John Lees trying to get on the honours list with the Preston men. The last man to win this title from Preston was a man called Fred Salisbury in 1958. And John Lees is trying to join company with him. He's led playing for a lot of cash. First prize of £2,000 and a second prize of £1,000. John Lees made his first instalment to towards picking that 2,000 up with a ball about eight inches off the jack. Ellis, not a mile away from winning with this ball if he can run. Ooh, bit close. Referee on his way up. Oh, the crowd not giving him a very good reception. I think that's a bit unfair, really, because gets involved in difficult decisions. Now Lee's definitely off the road with the second ball. John Lee's having a look at the end, and Ellis on his way up. Must really fancy his own ball. It's been intimated by the referee, and Ellis gets the chalk. And the first chalk goes on the board. Uh, not counting the handicap score. Steve Ellis, six, John Lee's, five. Big close up. Again, asking for the referee's advice, and again, the crowd. Struck Ellis, tried to take it out, just missed it. So Lee's obviously on. Examining those pretty closely. And you heard the verdict uh, six across, meaning that John Lee's counted one. A certain amount of feeling building up amongst the spectators, no all at times. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit unfortunate for the referee. Um, he had a decision to make, and apparently the, the measures slipped when uh, they were measuring Tommy Hayes' ball in the semi-final. And uh, obviously they've got to be measured again. Uh, probably a lot of the crowd, crowd don't realise. Yeah, particularly them who have a few Bob and Tommy Hayes, no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's really what causes the outburst. The, 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 it's the depth of the pocket, I think, in this case. Ellis stepped in to beat the lead, made by John Lee's ball on the left. Ellis and the referee again comes over just to confirm that.
back again. Ken Alcott, the referee. Walking round and round. Crowd now quietened a little bit. He's suggested not given a decision, perhaps playing it safe now. Else just doesn't give it any decision and he's asking for measures. Well, the referee, of course, uh, the crowd remembering uh, the end of the previous semi final. Uh, which was a very close measure, and as Noel was saying, one of the measures slipped, and uh, the people with money were very displeased, and they got the booze. Of course, referees in certain sports expect to get barracked and a bit of a rowdy reception. Not really in Crown Green. Once again, the measure's on the way over. Don't the crowd will certainly be watching this measure very closely. I've been really... One to Alice. No comments from the crowd. Spectators uh, at Crown Green Bowling, of course, are sometimes quick to make the feelings known, aren't they, Harry? I can remember being pelted with pennies at the end of one competition. <laughs> yeah, that was the year we got a pretty big fee when we picked it all up, Richard. It was all right, but still, you're quite right. It's, I think it's where the money lies, as much as anything. It's a like a bet, and they feel a bit sorry for the lad who's gone out. So what about that for a ball? Ah, what a brilliant wood there from... John Lees. Well, he's round about again. Alice, if he can run, this is a, some sort of a chance. Oh, he's done it. Has he kissed the jack the wrong way? Left two again, the referee being kept busy and the crowd not leaving him alone. Signal that that ball is on, on the left. Satisfied with one. Seven across. Nothing in it, seven across, Steve Ellis, John Lees. Well, we've had one or two ends here and all, haven't we, where there have been a funny lie on balls, you know, balls rested on another one, and it's a bit difficult, isn't it, to make that sort of decision? Yeah, I think uh, the referee has got to say in that situation that he's not sure, and uh, for the players to go and have a look for themselves. Like a ball a dead length. Here's the new one. It's just a little bit short. But the referee can all cut confirms he really fancies the ball belonging to Steve Ellis very strongly. Can he run? Gotta run away. Just give up, John. Not altered the end. Ellis still given the verdict. Oh, a good ball from Ellis. Counts a double. Yeah, some very well deserved applause for Steve Ellis. Quality bowling. Opens up a lead, he's on nine, John Lee's seven.
That's Steve Ellis, number one. Richard, he's been done in the final twice here as a very young man. Vowed he'd come back and pick up the title. And his third appearance, he's bang in front. 9-7. It's a fairly good ball, but it's about two foot six short of the jack. It's drifted away on the left. Every inch of peg out of these marks, playing the difficult swinging peg marks, finger peg down into the corner. Lee's on a good road here if he can stop. The run a bit sharp round the back. Bit of applause from the crowd. Could well beat it. Lee's maybe in with some sort of a chance, but again, likes it. One to Lee's. So nobody yet able to put uh, a decisive little one together. Just one chalk in it. runs a little more. Good lead. Must look really close to Steve Ellis. Second ball is at the end on the way. It's pegged on the top side. Zone. Gets another, another good ball there from Lees. Now Ellis, on his way over, I think, to have a look at the end, and then go back and decide his plan of attack. He's two down at the moment. It's Ellis, ball on the right, and the two on the left belonging to John Lees. Stands a double, and he's one behind in the match, 8-9. Going on the outside, won't alter the end. Two to Lees. Well, under the circumstances, Noel, I thought that was uh, a second wood that Steve Ellis wouldn't have been at all pleased about, would he? No, I think he, he had a problem there, really. John Lee's short ball was smack bang in the way, and uh, he probably thought that his best chance, uh, weighing up the percentages, was to change his peg and uh, be far enough. Unfortunately for him, he played it just a bit too wide. Yeah, it's a very, di it's a very difficult thing to do. And yeah, uh, Speed was right to do the job, but uh, just a bit too wide.
got a bit of a funny situation here, Noel, haven't we? Because now Lees is taking uh, Ellis on at his own type of game. You they know, do. playing finger peg just down the middle of the green. Yes, they do tend to play the same sort of marks, these two, and uh, I was just, just going to mention that uh, either one of them has got to try and do something different or he's just got to play exceptionally well as his own game. One to John Lees. Uh, nothing that would really win any prizes, but uh, John Lees wins it. He's on 11, Steve Ellis 9. John Lees of Preston now taking the lead. Three lads at home, no doubt, watching with great interest to see how the dad goes on. Martin, Kevin, and Stephen, all keen bulls enthusiasts, hoping that dad will bring home the famous Waterloo Trophy, not to mention the £2,000 that goes with it. Chance or two, and John Lees is in no doubt. Ellis now got to find one. Otherwise, Lees opens a good gap. Peg. Oh. On to Lees. Good attempt that, no, wasn't it, from Ellis? Just tried to sit that ball out. Yeah, if it had just halved it, he'd have fallen in himself then, and. Uh... As it, as it happens, it, uh, he's just fallen the wrong way. Went the right way so far as John Lees is concerned, and uh, they'll be wearing a track over this piece of land if they're not careful. It's uh, up and down the same area, isn't it? It is, yes. Uh, where they're actually bowling now to the north stand, uh, the balls tend to run that little bit quicker, slightly downhill. touch just played one very adjacent John Lee's always to back bad ball really from Lee's but too much in it it's from Brown Edge his home club at Bamba Bridge Ellis does the full execution job there and pegs at full house, a double maximum at the end. Well, the bookmakers uh, just a few minutes ago were quoting even money on Steve Ellis. Yesterday was out at what, 20 to 1, was it? Something like that, perhaps even bigger. Good length and from a fairly long way. John Lee's got a run, gets down the hill, it wins. And again, a bit more. Won it. Short. 
can't get here. The crowd already condemned this ball. It's still running, but it can't get in the frame. It's died. And just one chalk in it. Steve Ellis, 11. John Lee's, 13. John Lee, 11. Well, here's the change that perhaps uh, we were anticipating, Noel. Change of land altogether. Yes, Steve uh, looks as though he was making for the corners, and if it had got in at that end, I think it would have uh, gone right back in the far corner. Uh, John has elected to go across the green. Uh, in previous rounds, I've seen him play across the green here exceptionally well. He's not led a very good ball there, but... Uh, it's not an easy piece of land. Easy to be short. Yeah, like Steve Ellis. <laughs> John Lees will want to uh, improve considerably on his first ward at this end. Yes, he's got to just pass the short ball, get round it, round it, don't peg into it, run on, played one, a real flat pot, touch the jack, very good ball. And now Ellis has got the problems back in his backyard. Ellis having a look at all the options that may be open to him. John Lees just makes himself ready for the next end. Tight straightens himself out a bit. Well, this is a brave ball. He gets some pegs round the top. This is something like a brave ball, but it's not going to do it. One to Lees. Yeah, Steve Ellis knew that uh, there was probably nothing down for him at that end after uh, John Lees delivered his second bowl. There's John Lees' uh, concentration etched on his face. He looks almost exhausted. Uh, such is the tension in a Waterloo final. I know it's only too well. I was physically and mentally drained after, after my final here. John Lees again leading the jack. If he can keep hold of this little white jack, he can be picking up the title and the money. Again, led a nagging ball about half a yard short of the jack. But Ellis having to produce good balls to get in. Found one. If it can run, won it. Shot there of Lees coming down. Play at the end. Smack on the road. He might go through the gap. Lick on his own board. He's won off it. Oh, a table leg job. Kiss Cameron in off. John looked at the sky and let's hope his thanks were appreciated because it landed right on the jack. And Ellis again with the problems. Sort all the timber out in a minute, but I think at Lees <laughs> has finished up with one. Yes, John Lees accepts that uh, there was just one after that uh, remarkable strike by Steve Ellis. Didn't come off. Fortune not favouring the brave. Now then, Noel, swinging a bit now. 
Lee's opened up a bit of a gap. Yes, he's just getting away from him. Uh, I was just remembering back to the last final Steve was in, and it's almost exactly the same mark that uh, Bill Horton beat him on in the final in 1974. I wonder if that thought is uh, running through Steve Ellis's mind as well. Well, he must be wondering now. He's, he's been in the final twice before, and I should think he's, uh, it's going through his mind. Yeah, good ball from Ellis. Just lodged on the ball belonging to John Lee's. He's got to run. He's got to run this ball. Can keep coming. And again, give up. Ellis just asking for confirmation that he's on. A little bit of trouble at the moment. He's got the ball is way out of difficulty here. Left it on the mat. Only one. A little let lip ball from Ellis in down just out of the corner. Thumb peg mark. John Lee's now just nicely paced, but just short dies. Give up. It's an important end this for Steve Ellis, really. 15 12 down. You could just do with the stepping the pressure up a bit. Time to play a ball like that. May have altered the end. The referee's on his way over. Quick survey job. Not much in him, Steve, really. He's just favourite, isn't he? The winner last year yeah. just at the back. He's just favourite. Yeah, the consultation there resulting in uh, the suggestion that John Lee's his favourite. John Lee's wants to have a look for himself. He's having a major, but he fancies John. Very difficult yeah, to make a decision. That, not a lot in it. It's not as easy as you think that. It's not as easy as that major, isn't it? Well, Steve Ellis is taking it very calmly, just uh, sitting down there as a spectator. Yes, taking a bit of a well-earned rest, and he's hoping that his judgment's wrong here because I think he strongly fancies the ball belonging to John Lees. And John Lees has played, tried to count another for nothing. On the outside, very interest interesting here to see the outcome of the measure. Measure that one against these two. Measure that one against these two. <laughs> Throw that. That's one jump. Yeah. Only one jump. Okay. Only one jump. John being John Lees. And the score now is 16 to John Lees, 12 to Steve Ellis. Right, 
Now the book is chanting. Caused a bit of a disturbance in the market. John Lee's opened up a four chart gap and it's now six to four Ellis. Gone second favourite. The man from Preston looking for victory. Made a bit of a rambler straight off. Lifeline for Ellis. To find a good ball. Certainly a bit nearer. Roundabout. Two foot six. Ellis could use a couple of good shots here, couldn't he? He could use them, but he's, I don't think he's going to get them. Not, not even being here, yeah. Sneak one there, Ellis. Cut the deficit down to three shots. 13 to Ellis and 16 to John Lees. Nicely paced. Good ball. Dead length. Might be a little bit down in the bottom side. Can't come any nearer. Second. Good length, but well off a road. And Alice is low. Low. There's a chance for John Lees. Can he run? He's short. Give up. One to Ellis. Closing the gap all the time. John Lee certainly won't be congratulating himself on his performance at that end. And uh, it means that Steve Ellis Keeps the jack, sets the mark. The position he really needs to be in now. Into the corners, no? Yes, I thought he might try that. Off into the shadow of the stand, the new stand. gone about a yard past the jack. He looks as low as he dare be. Down in the bottom side, he's missed the road. Bit difficult mark, isn't it, Noel, this finger peg down into this corner? It is. Uh, Steve's balls uh, will go straight to the jack on this mark. He's uh, just gone a bit too far there, but... Uh, He's a better chance of following the jack with his balls. And he's down again. 
certainly had to pick some to have any chance. What's happened there, Harry, is that uh, John knows his balls are a little bit stronger and has given them a little bit more to do, and the crown of the, of the green has taken the balls down to the right-hand side. Yes, yeah, just pushed them down, haven't they? The timber's not pegged, you see. Ellis has played on the top side, hasn't he, of the, of the mark. He's taken one out, Ellis. Certainly looking for another. And if he does, he's back, smack back in this match at 16 apiece. And... Yes, they want the close line out again. Throw <laughs> that. Only one. Well, one to Steve Ellis, takes him to 15, John Lee's on 16, but uh, we've got a game on our hands. Steve Ellis will set uh, a relatively long mark. Into the bottom corner. Short Richard that of running came you smack on the road. He was he only curled away a little bit because he was short. It's so one here, they'll have to run. Gets down the hill, it could pinch it, but it's labouring now and shorts and give up. nicely on this ball not be a mile away from the jack when it finishes this real ball touch it played through but he's not not sent it anywhere near far enough he saved one a good second ball and a saver Bang on the road, this ball. Absolutely smack on the road. A really good ball from Ellis. Full trap stopped about eight inches dead level with the jack. And Lee's had a bad jump there. I think he just ran over a rabbit there. And all the jumped up yeah. about six inches in the air. I think he was slightly tight as well. Um, there again, he's, as I said before, his balls are just that little bit keener, and Steve's put this jack right on the on a ridge. John Lees is going to have trouble trying to beat that ball. Played another one all round about. Two good balls on this mark. Here's a could be one one heck of a good ball if he beats it. Not a mile away. It's going to slide pick... away. Well, that's how the game changes. Uh, nothing goes right for John Lees. 
Steve Ellis there, the number one on his back, in pole position. He's in front now. 18-16. Well, Ellis now taking the lead after making a, a very, very timely six break. Now to slide from the halfway house at Blackpool is more than halfway towards victory. But he's played a short ball and given Lee some sort of a chance to get in. Keep running and again. Won it. Run hard, and again, might just make it. I'll get into the back of that ball, it's second. Lee's taking no chances, comes in the tradesman's entrance, turned his peg round, come the straight peg end, try to count another. Stops. some applause from the crowd but Ellis is not that convinced that Lee's has got a double taking the winning wood out well Lee's is in no doubt he thinks he's got two to level the match at 18 all so once again we have the string men on. <laughs> Just the one to John Lee's. Leaves the game very delicately balanced. John Lee 17, Steve Ellis 18. First man to 21 collects £2,000. And the considerable prestige of being the Waterloo champion. Yes, it must be great because Noel Burris, that's here with us today, knows what it's like to be Waterloo champion. Tremendous title to pick up the Derby of Bulls. It's the ambition of every man that ever plays this game of Crown Green Bowling to become Waterloo champion. Now, good, close, contested final here. John Lees again playing the second ball in the blue pullover. Found one. Yes. Gets down, he climb a little bit now and peg up in the air. One to Lee's, squares the match at 18 across. Couldn't be a finer balance for a great climax to this Waterloo final. The lead having changed hands a couple of times. The finalists level now, and John Lees sets the mark. Well, Noel, is it going to be that uh, Steve Ellis becomes the owner of the unwanted title, three times runner-up in the Waterloo? Well, it could be, but John's played a very short ball there and given Steve every opportunity to get in. 
Could be a few nerves tingling out there now. He is the new one. Dead length. Lee's made a bad lead there, just at the time he wanted to play a really good ball. And now, he's got a fairly good ball to beat, and his own ball must be banging the road. He might have a job to get past if he can run, but he's short again. He's waving it on, but it's wasting his time. It won't go any farther. He's stopped well short. Ellis now with a great chance of counting a double to go 2018 in front. Turned his peg round, coming on the top side, looking for a really good ball. Runs anymore and pegs, it's got a double. Good ball from Ellis. Takes him to one chalk of victory, 2018 against John Lees. Well, no, it looks as though he might break the jinx, Sam. I'm a great believer in fate, and I've been, been saying all day that uh, I thought Steve would just do it. Well, I'm sure that Steve feels the same way you do, Noel. He'll have broke the jinx this time. Twice runner-up, but now poised to just make a good lead to clinch the title. Well, he's put the Jack right on that ridge again, where John Lee's had trouble trying to get on the right line. Well, looking for a lead. Ever he wanted a lead, he's going to make one here. He's whipping away. Not a mile off. Plow the crowd applauding that ball. It's on a difficult piece of land. John Lee's had a lot of difficulty down here last time. Trying to find the land. He's waving it on Lee's. Doesn't think it's got the legs. Still going. Still running. Got a chance. Inquiries. Yeah, asking how far. Got knocking a foot. Quite a lot of confusion from the crowd. Ken Alcock, the referee there, has informed Ellis, you've got to knock him a foot, which means that Ellis must still be on, but he didn't touch that front ball belonging to Lees. Well, if Lees has got to lick these, otherwise it's all over. Waterloo title and the £2,000 goes to Steve Ellis and for me, he's weighed in, weighed in, it's all over, Steve and Ellis from Kirkham and Blackpool wins the Waterloo title at the third attempt in the final, beating John Lees of Preston, 21-18. So what a marvellous story from this year's uh, final of the Waterloo Handicap in Blackpool. The winner, Steve Ellis from Kirkham, not far away from here in Blackpool. And uh, that is the third time he's appeared in a Waterloo final. He was here in 1971 and he got beaten. He was here in 1974 and he got beaten again. Ten years later, he bided his time. He's still a young man. He is victorious in this year's Waterloo Handicap.